Nancy. All right, take your Bible this evening, if you would, and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, if you would please, we'll read a few verses there. We're going to be talking about the Apostle John this evening. We've talked about Andrew, and then we talked about James, and tonight will be John. John 1, and let's look together at verse number 35, will you please? Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking unto Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of this passage of Scripture tonight. And, Lord, as we look to study your word this evening and study about the life of John, Lord, there's so much uh, that we could glean from the life of this man. And the Lord, certainly, he is an example for us and a model for us that we could, he, could, he could be a pattern for us and a pattern our life after him. Lord, the, the things you taught him, I pray that we would learn from you as well. And so, Father, open our understanding tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, you would be the teacher this evening. And you'd help us to behold wondrous things out of your word tonight. And I'll thank you for it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we talk about John. He's the younger brother of James. <clears throat> they were sons of Zebedee. This might be a little bright, Jimmy. Just a little bit, all right? And um, so, John. now John's name means Jehovah is gracious. Jehovah is is gracious. By the way, Zebedee means gift of God. So he's in a house where his dad is a gift from God and he is named because Jehovah is gracious. So it gives you a little idea this must have been a, a pretty godly home. Must have been a home where they wanted to honor the Lord and they wanted to please God. And so I think it was a godly home that James and John came from. And his mother, of course, we know was Salome or Salome. Um, she was the sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Now, James and John were normal brothers uh, and, and rough and tumble of their day. That's why Jesus gave them a nickname or a surname. He called them the Sons of Thunder. The sons of thunder. They were, uh, they were, they were fishermen, and uh, they were rough guys. As we said about Andrew, if you're going to be a follower of John the Baptist, and John was a follower of John the Baptist, uh, you're not going to be a wimp. Uh, nobody followed John who had lace on their underwear, and um, they were they were men's men, all right, and uh, that's for sure. So we see first of all, we're look at John's conversion, John's conversion, his conversion, and we just read about it here. In John chapter 1, when <clears throat> John is announcing, John the Baptist, that is, is announcing Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. And John is penning this book now, remember, we're in the Gospel of John, so he's the one who wrote this. And notice what he said in verse number uh, 34, notice he says, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And again, the next day after John stood, that's John the Baptist, and two of his disciples. Now, two of his disciples, we know later on that he mentions that one of these two was Andrew. The other one, not mentioned, is John. Okay, so these are the two that are there that day. And, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, in verse 36, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, who are the two disciples? Yeah, Andrew and John, okay. They heard him speak. They heard John speak, 
And they heard him announce that here's the Lamb of God. And so what did they do? They followed Jesus. Now they no longer are following John. They have gone on to follow Jesus. That's what John wanted. That's what John had trained them to do. He said, there's coming one after me. The latchet of whose shoes I'm unworthy and unloose. There's coming one after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He was, he was preparing them for Jesus Christ. And so he was ready, and they were ready. They had learned well, and they were ready for the Lamb of God. And as soon as they knew that this was the Son of God, this was the Lamb of God, he began to follow Jesus. So he was ready to follow Christ because of John the Baptist's ministry. And so Christ, notice, Christ spoke. That's the Word. And they heard it. That's faith. Then they followed that's salvation. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know how you got saved? You heard the Word. Somebody told you what the Word of God says about salvation and your need of a Savior and your need to uh, receive your forgiveness of sin and get the gift of eternal life. You heard it and you heard the Word and you believed the Word. That's faith. And then you received Christ as your Savior. You followed Him. That's salvation. And that was His conversion. All right. Now, where we'll spend the bulk of our time tonight is number two, and that is His character. His character. You understand, Jesus <clears throat> took 12 very different individuals from differing backgrounds and and differing ideas about what he was even there for. And he's got to teach them and mold them into men that are going to carry on his work after he goes back to heaven. And, and there are times, you know, you, you read in the Gospels where Jesus sighed. <sighs> and, and he had to be thinking, I'm leaving it all to these guys. And you'll, you'll understand. Uh, sometimes he probably does that with you and me. When he sees that he's left the work to us uh, in our day, in our generation. But uh, there's many things that, that the disciples had to learn, and John is a great example of that. The first thing that John, I think he, uh, that the Lord taught him, as well as the other disciples, but particularly John, is how to balance truth with love. How to balance truth with love. Now for this, I want you to go back to the Gospel of Mark. Matthew, then Mark. The second book of the New Testament. And look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Notice with me verse number 38. Mark 9 and verse 38. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which should do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. So, though John, now listen, though John is going to become known as a beloved, the beloved disciple, or sometimes referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, he wasn't always that way. He had to learn that. He wasn't naturally that way. You know what John was when he began to follow Jesus? John was passionate, but he was narrow-minded unbending, reckless, impetuous, and brash. Not only that, he was pretty personally ambitious. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you will see, and you'll see tonight as we go through his life a little bit, you're going to see John change. You're going to see a transformation take place in his life. But really, a, a transformation that's as drastic as the caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It is a transformation. Complete. 
And it's an example of what ought to happen to you and me as we follow Jesus Christ. It's an example of what ought to happen to us as we grow in Christ. And one of the major things that we learn as we grow in Christ is to put things in balance in our life. There's always a balance of truth and love. John began very heavy on the truth, but was lacking in love. Here in Mark 9 is the only time it's recorded in the Gospels that John speaks. The only time that he spoke by himself is right here in this incident. And you see his elitism, his lack of genuine love for people. Remember with James last week, it was the village in Samaria that didn't want to receive Jesus. And what did they want to do to those people? Yeah, let's burn them up. Call fire down from heaven and roast them right now. Uh, boy, that's loving, isn't it? Now, listen, now this isn't Samaritans who they didn't like, remember? They had no dealings with the Samaritans. They didn't care for them anyway. This is not Samaritans. This is another believer. He's doing things in Jesus' name. But he's not of their group. He's not following with them. And so, John is saying, we told him to stop it. That's what he told him. We forbade him. In other words, hey, if, if he's not of our group, he's not any good. If he's not of our group, he can't be doing anything that God wants. You see the pride? You see, do you see, it, it, they, they'd already been to the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, though Jesus had told them, you can't tell anybody about it, think about these guys who are debating about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think about these guys who already, out of, out of the, the, the followers of Jesus, He chose 12 and they made the cut. And now, they get to go to the mountain and see Jesus transfigured before them. Really glorified in their presence. And seeing Moses and Elijah and hearing the voice of God, I mean, had to think, man, we're pretty special. I'm really somebody. And so when someone else is doing something in Jesus' name, but he's not one of us, <laughs> stop it, man. You got no business doing that. You're not like us. You're not in our group. Only we can do things like that. How selfish. How prideful. Do you see it? Do you understand? Now, by the way, notice, notice again. Look back at Mark 9. Jesus is teaching them something. Back up a little bit. Verse 34. They held their, by the way, go back to verse 33. When he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves, by the way? By the way, is Jesus looking for information? No. Did he know what they talked about? Sure. What is he looking for? A confession. <laughs> he wants them to be honest with him. Okay? When, when God tells us to confess our sin, is that because he doesn't know them? No. He needs us to confess them. He wants us to admit it to him. Okay? So they held their peace. <laughs> Nobody was going to tell him. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be what, church? Greatest. So he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire be first, the same to be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. So he's teaching them about, you want to be great, you've got to be a servant. In fact, you can be like this little child. Okay? 
Now, John answered him. This isn't, this isn't something that maybe just took place, but as Jesus talks and illustrates this, who's going to be the greatest and how do we need to be a servant, John's convicted. And what comes to his mind is, well, maybe I shouldn't have told that guy to stop it. Maybe I was pretty harsh. Maybe, maybe I'm too arrogant. Maybe, maybe I'm too harsh with the truth. And I didn't show him nothing. He's, he's, you're beginning to see the Lord's teaching is impacting him. It bothered him that he said that or he wouldn't have brought it up to the Lord. He's bothered by that. Something inside of John was beginning to change and he was seeing his lack of love as something that wasn't very desirable. He'd always been naturally zealous for the truth. That was never an issue. His issue is, you got to love people. See, truth without love is brutality. But love without truth is hypocrisy. The Bible says we ought to have love in 1 Corinthians that charity rejoices in the truth. You don't need mushy sentimentality. You don't need to just say things that people want to hear when they're not right. You don't just want to tell people things that will tickle their ears. That's why Paul told Timothy, you preach the Word because the days are going to come when they won't endure sound doctrine, but they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And People come to church often and there's churches across this land, sadly, where they come and, and the preacher just scratches where it itches. And the people go home and say, boy, that felt good. And there's no truth. It's all love. But we don't need to get all our theological ducks in a row and have all our doctrine straight as an arrow and then be so unloving and cold-hearted that we don't care about anybody. Balance truth with love. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We'll, we'll come back to the Gospels again, but go, go over to the right in your Bible, to the book of Ephesians. You'll go past 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the book of Galatians, and then you'll hit the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Notice what Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus here. And notice how he words this to the church. In verse 13 of chapter 4, Paul writes, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. A perfect never means sinless in the Bible. It means, it means you're mature as a Christian. It talks about um, coming into the knowledge of the Son of God. We're to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are continually... What is God's purpose for all of us? To be conformed to the image of His Son. He's, he's trying to get us to be like Jesus. Okay, And so, He's working on that until we become a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Saying, why don't you grow up and, and grow in the knowledge of Christ? When you do that, you won't be deceived. Children, you can easily deceive a child. You know, you can, you can have something in your hand and, and you can crumble it up and, and, and you say, okay, now, which hand is it in? You can fool them every time. I don't fool you. You know it's in this one. All right? But you understand? Grow up. Notice what else he says. So what do you say? Verse 15, here it is. But speaking the truth, How? in love, may grow up into Him in all things. May grow up into who? Christ. In how many things? 
all things. All things. Which is the head, even Christ. So you grow up, and will you speak the truth in love? Growing to be like Christ means you'll speak the truth in love to people. That's how, that's what it means to be Christ like. That's how you define Christian maturity. We know the truth as God's Word defines it, and we love people as Christ loves people. Jesus had the perfect balance of truth and love. The Bible says He was full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. And you have to have that balance. And the Lord teaches us that balance. He taught John that balance. The second thing he taught John, number two, is he taught him to balance ambition with humility. Ambition and humility. We go back to Mark chapter 9. Go back to the passage we read a minute ago where he sets the little child in the midst. And again, they've already disputed about who's going to be greatest, who's going to sit on the right hand, who's going to sit on the left hand of Jesus in glory. And that, that, that even comes after Jesus has taught them about being a servant and being humble. You imagine the pride and the ambition they had to completely overlook it? But don't, but, 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 don't. You, ever, you ever heard a message? And, and before you even got home that night, you did something or said something that completely contradicted what you just heard preached? And somebody could rightfully look at you and say, were you in church tonight? Were you in church today? Did you hear what was preached? Did you hear the message? Because just that fast, we, don't, we just disregard it and go do what we want to do anyway. Ambition. Selfish ambition. It shows how utterly empty of humility James and John really were. Now, when they say, hey, we want... We want to sit one on the right hand, one on the left hand, beside you in glory. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus didn't rebuke him for that. What did he ask him? Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism? Are you willing to drink of the cup of suffering that I'm going to drink of? And of course, they flippantly said, "What? Yeah, sure, absolutely." Very flippantly. See, they wanted to obtain the position more than they wanted to be worthy of the position. But the highest positions in God's kingdom are reserved for the most humble saints on earth. In Mark 10, if you look at verse number 42, it's in verse 35 when they came to Him and asked Him about and what, what they started out with, look at, it, look at it with me, verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Well, that's pretty, pretty open. Here, Lord, here's a blank check. Will you sign it? Hmm? And he said to them, What would ye that I should do for you? Well, all we want is, you, we, we want to grant us that we'll sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. Jesus said, you know not what you ask. Then he asked them about being drinking a cup and being baptized. And of course, he said, but it's not mine to give. It's, that's reserved for my Father, for whom it's, or whoever is prepared. But notice what he said. When the ten heard it, verse 41, they began to much displeased with James and John. Why would they be displeased with James and John? You think they were displeased because they weren't very humble? 
You think they were displeased because they weren't that humility? No, they were displeased because that's what they wanted. What do you mean? What are you asking that for? That's where I wanted to sit. That's where I want to be. They were all filled with ambition. So Jesus, verse 42, called them to Him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them, but so shall it not be among you. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. The disciples, if you want to be the greatest, be the servant of all. The disciples were very slow to learn this lesson. I think John probably caught it as much as any of them. You don't have to turn over there, but you can write it down. And John 13 is where Jesus is going to have the what's called the Last Supper with the disciples in the upper room. You remember? He goes there and they're sitting there already and Jesus comes in. And they're sitting there, a basin of water and some towels. Normally, a servant would take that basin when you came into the room, whoever owned the building, whoever owned the home, and they would wash the feet of those who come into the house. So here the disciples are there. They're there before Jesus arrives. Jesus comes in and He sits down. And they're, they're conversing, they're talking, whether it's before the meal or after the meal. Nobody, none of the twelve, get up and go to that basin and begin to wash anybody's feet. So who did? Jesus did. He got up, took off his outer garment, put the towel around him, and began to go around and wash the feet of the disciples. Who does that work? A servant does. And Jesus did it to them. Can you imagine the embarrassment? It was interesting in reading about this. D.L. Moody used to have a Bible conference every year in Northfield, Massachusetts. Many, many men from Europe would come over, the drivers for the conference. And one, one thing they're used to in Europe during those days, and we're in the 1800s, when they would retire for the evening, they would set their shoes outside their door because servants would clean their shoes, polish them up, and have them there in the morning. They'd get up and their shoes would be all cleaned up for the next day. Well, they're, even though they're in America, they thought they'd do the same thing. Not thinking about it, Moody was walking through the hallway just praying for the men who'd come when he saw the shoes. And he knew what was going on. He'd been in Europe. And D Dwight Moody picked everybody's shoes up, took them to his room. And the only reason we know this was a man came to his room and caught him doing it and helped him finish polishing all the shoes and putting them back outside everybody's door. Why? Because whoever is greatest among you, let him be your servant. What is it? What is it? Hey, Hey, what is it that's beneath you to do? Oh, I'm not doing that. Well, I'll do some things, but I'm not doing that. Well, that guy I am, a servant. Yeah. Supposed to be. Shouldn't be anything that's beneath you. John did learn it. By the way, it's interesting, isn't it? The only, got, the only of the four Gospels, only one of them mentions that washing of the feet. It's John. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Throughout the Gospel of John, he never mentions his name. He never refers to himself. Every reference to himself 
He uses it to try to honor Christ. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, does that mean Jesus didn't love them all? No, of course he did. But I think, I think he probably penned it that way because it meant something to him. Knowing how he was, knowing the pride in his heart, knowing the ambition in his heart, knowing his failures, his shortcomings, and yet he still loves me. I think that impacted John. So often we, we want to hide we want to try to hide things from some people that, that we, we think, boy, if they find this out about me, they won't care to be around me. And so we keep things in the background because if they know this about me, they won't want to be around me. God knows everything. And He wants to be around you. No wonder He thought, He loves me. What an amazing thing that He loves me. And so John as most of us had to learn, to balance ambition and humility. It's okay to have an ambition to do something for God and to do great things for God. But ask God that He would do it through you and do it with you and in you. William Carey was the one who said, expect uh, uh, he said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. But when he was announced at a, at a conference when he came back for many years on the mission field and, and, and they bragged on and on about William Carey, he got up and he said, don't talk about William Carey. I wish only to talk about William Carey's Savior. That's greatness. It's not about you. It's not about me. Not about our ambitions. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. So you learn to learn to balance. Look at, look at a verse with me in the book of Revelation. The, of course, John wrote the book of Revelation. And just as a side note, let me help you. It's not the book of Revelations. Plural. It's the book of Revelation. Because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not even the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of Christ. Okay? But notice in, in chapter 1, notice how John, he names himself here in Revelation, and notice how he phrases it, I, John, 1, 9 of Revelation. I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who's John? The apostle? John? You know, the, the, one of the top, top four apostles? John, I was at the Mount of Transfiguration. No, just John, your brother, your companion in tribulation. Do you see humility that John has now that he didn't have when he started? And let me, let me go backwards to this guy, to, to the guy who he said was doing miracles in Jesus' name, and we said, but he wasn't with us, so we said we, we forbade him. You know, here's, here's someone you know. God... <laughs> God honors and blesses people who love Him and want to serve Him. Not, not all of those people are independent Baptists. Okay? So, don't, don't get to, sometimes we get to think as independent Baptists, we get pretty proud and arrogant too, and we think we're the only ones doing anything. And, and God has to help us that that you know what, there's other folks who do it too. Now listen, what Jesus didn't tell them. Did he tell them, go get that guy and tell him to join us? No. Did he say, well, let's go over there and join him? No. He said, he's going to keep doing what he's doing. We'll keep doing what we're doing. But, but he's doing something in my name. He's not against us. He's for us. 
Paul, in the book of Philippians, said uh, some are preaching Christ and some do it out of envy, some do it out of strife, some... He said, but listen, in every way, whether in pretense, whether they're faking it, or whether they're doing it in truth, I rejoice that Christ is preached. I rejoice that it's not false teaching going on. All right? Let's go to number three. Got to hurry. Man, time's going away too fast. Are you okay? Are you all right? Okay. C there is he was taught to balance suffering with glory. Suffering with glory. Now, look at Mark 14. Would you please? Mark 14 and look at verse number 50. Just a short verse, but you know what, what it is when Jesus was taken away in the garden by Judas and the soldiers. What happened? Verse 50. They all, who's they? The disciples, that's right. They all did what? forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young man laid hold on young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And then of course Jesus was led away and Peter followed him afar off. So the the we know you say they're trying to balance now listen, they're trying to balance glory and suffering. We know they we know they wanted glory. I just want to sit on the right hand right hand and left hand, that's all. I just want to be number one. But their dislike of suffering is never any more clearly seen than right here. When it comes time to suffer and be there for the suffering Christ, they all ran away. Despite the fact they all said, Not me. You say, Oh, Peter said, and not me. No, likewise said they. All. They all chimed in. Oh, they wanted the glory of the throne, but not the suffering to get there. They wanted the crown, but not the cross. If I want the reward of glory, I must be willing to endure suffering. Romans 8. Verses 17 and 18 say this, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wow. Remember, they wanted the chief seats. And Jesus said, there's a price to pay for those. They didn't want to pay for those. That's why Jesus asked them, are you willing to drink of the cup? Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? How quickly they agreed. But when faced with the opportunity to do exactly that, they took off and ran away. Oh, I know. We like to talk about Jesus coming and we're going to be with the Lord and we're going to rule and reign with Him. Have you suffered for him here? We don't. Nobody, nobody ever says, Lord, let me suffer. No, as soon as we suffer, what do we say? What, what's happened? Why is this happening to me? How come I got to have it so tough? And my thought always is am I really complaining to Jesus that I have to suffer? Am I telling Jesus? Why am I suffering? The one who suffered for me? Hmm. You know what's great? They had that opportunity to suffer and they blew it. They all ran away. But you know what's wonderful? God didn't take that as final. 
Aren't you glad God doesn't take your failures as final? Aren't you glad that when you, when you messed up, you say, oh, God's the God of the second chance. i got news for you. He's more than two chances. Or there wouldn't be many of us here tonight. He didn't take their failures final. Every one of the disciples were covered. Every one of them learned to willingly suffer for Jesus Christ. In fact, listen, every one of them were martyred except for John. And they tried. But every one of them knew what it was to suffer for Jesus Christ. And martyred, by the way, in what we would consider the prime of their life. Now John lived to be, he's the only one who lived to be in old age on the Isle of Patmos when he got the revelation. But you know, John was the only one who saw the suffering of Jesus up close. Who was at the foot of the cross? The women and one disciple, John. Just John. John also saw the suffering as the first of the disciples to be martyred was his brother. Herod took James and had him beheaded. That was my brother. That, that had to hurt. He had to feel that, that pain and that suffering. And then imagine him as one by one, word comes that Matthew's been killed. Peter's been killed. On down, every one of them. So he's the only one left. John went through it all. Well, that's him learning the balance suffering and glory. Do you accept suffering? Would you remember something? All of us will have to go through some suffering in this life. And all of us will cause some suffering in this life. You will have to endure it and you will be the cause of some for somebody else. That's just fact. So don't shun from that. Don't run from that. Embrace that. Because you get to know, you can know the fellowship of His sufferings. Oh, we like to pray, I want to know the power of His resurrection. There's not many that pray, I'd like to know the fellowship of His sufferings. But they had to learn that as disciples. Well, We've got to finish this up, okay? Number three is his compositions. That's, of course, what he wrote here in the New Testament. His compositions. John is responsible for five New Testament books. The Gospel of John is the one fourth book of the New Testament. And by the way, it, it's, it's interesting. Most of John's books, he, he, he's very plain about giving the purpose of why he wrote it. In John... He tells the purpose of why he wrote John. John 20 and verse number 31. John 20 and verse 31 says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Why is John written? So that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You have an unbeliever, you have someone who doesn't, you tell them to read John. Just read John. And ask God to reveal Himself and His Son to you. That's what it's written for. Okay? Then, he wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. 1 John talks about three things. Divine light. I think that's the first two chapters. Chapter 3 and 4, he talks about divine love. In chapter 5, he talks about divine life. These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13. 2 John 
talks about the walk of the believer. And amazing, you know what he says, how the believer ought to walk? In truth and in love. Balancing truth with love. He also, in 2 John, gives a warning about false teachers. That's in 2 John where he says, if someone comes to you and they're not bringing the doctrine of Christ, you do not invite them into your home. You do not tell them, God speed or God bless you. Now it's not, in our, in our culture, in our mind, we think, yeah, it's those Jehovah's Witnesses or those Mormons that knock on your door, you know, and you know, don't let them in, don't tell them God bless you. And, and, it, and that's true. They're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. But in, in John's day, you understand something. When, when, when visiting preachers or traveling preachers came to town, they didn't check in at the motel. They stayed in people's homes. And so they would want to come in and then they were teaching things that were not right. They were not teaching things to, truth about Christ. And so he's saying, you don't keep people like that in your home. And so he's, he's helping them to balance truth with love, okay? And then 3 John deals with three people. 3 John deals with three people. It commends Gaius, good guy. It condemns Diotrephes. Condemns Diotrephes. Why? He wanted to have the preeminence. He wanted to be a big shot. And he compliments Demetrius. Then you get to the book of Revelation that he wrote while he was in exile on an island called Patmos. P-A-T-M-O-S. And again, here's John who gives an outline of the book in chapter 1. In Revelation 1 and verse 19, you have the outline of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 and verse 19. I'm going to read it to you as soon as I get there. It says, Write the things which thou hast seen. That's chapter 1. He talks about the vision of Christ that he sees. Then, the things which are... That's going to be chapters 2 and 3. The seven churches that take up chapters 2 and 3. Then the things which shall be hereafter, that begins chapter 4 up through chapter 22. That's your outline of the book of Revelation. John became a choice model of what a righteous, Christ-like person ought to be. And the proof of that is at the crucifixion. When Jesus looks down at His mother, and what does He tell Mary? Behold your Son. And then He looked at John, and He said, Behold your mother. And the Bible says He took her to His home. John took care of Mary. He said, why would happen? Jesus was the oldest of the children. He's responsible for His mother. Joseph is, is not alive at this time. So it falls on Jesus. Well, well, he had other brothers. Yes, he did, but they weren't believers till after his resurrection. And he wasn't going to give his mom to unbelievers. Even though they were his flesh, it wasn't his flesh brothers, but in the family, stepbrothers, if you will. And so he says, I'm giving her to John. And history records that John stayed in Jerusalem and cared for Mary until she passed away. John had learned to be such a loving, humble servant that Jesus would entrust the care of his mother to him. That's a high honor. He told Peter, feed my sheep. But he told John, take care of mom. Take care of my mother. What a great, great example John is for us. I like John. And I like his teachable spirit. He, he didn't start out being the beloved disciple. He grew into that. He, he developed into that. In just, just about 18 months time. But he allowed God to change him. May we allow God to change us into what he would want us to be. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we?
Father, thank you so much for the Apostle John. Thank you, Lord, for the things we glean from his life. So difficult to squeeze it all in in just one study on a Wednesday night. Lord, I pray that as others uh, write down notes and maybe tonight they'll think and meditate on it a little bit, that we'll continue to be blessed and encouraged and challenged by the life of the Apostle John. Lord, we love you this evening and we pray that you'll continue to work in each one of our lives and help us each one to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.